we'll be having this uh, this evening a very very interesting uh, time, as I'm sure you will uh, you will see. A very interesting debate discussion between our uh, two guests for this uh, this this evening. Uh, we took advantage of uh, the fact that uh, Leo Panic, Professor Panic, who is as you know, Senior Canada Researcher in Comparative Political Economy and Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science at York University, Bastion of Radicalism, the Political Science Department at York uh, in the Northern American Hemisphere. Uh, so we took advantage of uh, Leo's presence for the Historical Materialism Conference, which takes place this, uh, this weekend. This is my opportunity to remind you of that. Uh, to, to, to organize this debate between uh, Leo and, and Alex, Alex Kalinikos, who also I'm sure doesn't really need an introduction here, but for those who don't know, uh, he is Professor of European Studies at King's College uh, uh, in, in uh, London. Both of them are authors of uh, several books. Uh, Leo is also the editor of the Socialist Register, which is very popular here at, at SOAS, uh, at least in the Department of Development Studies, I think also in Economics, in the reading list. And uh, um, his, uh, most, <coughs> among his, uh, his recent books, you have one on the topic we're discussing, American Empire and the Political Economy of Global Finance, uh, which <coughs> even authored like Renewing Socialism, another book, or edited. And uh, uh, Alex, Alex is also the, the, the author of very many books. Uh, one of his, I mean, the, his very last one, he's already announcing the next one, so he's a prolific writer. His very last one is also very much related to the topic of, uh, of the, the debate of this evening. The title is Imperialism and Global Political Economy. Um, so this will be definitely a very uh, uh, interesting discussion because also this is a very interesting topic. I mean, it's a discussion about, let's say, the, the, how we characterize the, the global structure of, uh, of, of power and the uh, uh, role or place of the United States, uh, status of the United States in this uh, global structure, global power structure. Uh, it's a debate in a sense which is uh, not uh, New. It's a recurrent debate actually about the structure of global power and the, the relation between various uh, imperialist uh, uh, powers, various uh, uh, major global capitalist powers. Uh, it's a debate that already in some form existed uh, even uh, in the eve of the First World War, but of course it, it took a very different shape uh, uh, after the Second World War in assessing the uh, new uh, uh, structure of, of global power after 45, and of course the debate was, be, became even more, uh, I, mean, I would say, in a new form, a new shape, with the new shape of international relations that followed the, the, the end of the so-called Cold War with the uh, collapse uh, of, uh, of the Soviet Union. And that's where we have the, the real debate of, uh, of this evening, uh, of which you have, I mean, there is already, I'm not suggesting that this will just be a repetition of it, but you have already a, at least a, a first uh, round of this kind of discussion between our two, our two guests for this evening uh, in articles published in 2005, 2006. Uh, uh, you can find them online, they were published in uh, International Socialism. And this is, as you will see, I'm sure, a very interesting discussion. So the way we will proceed is uh, each of uh, our two speakers for, for this evening will, will speak in turn for 20 minutes. We'll start with uh, Alex Kalinikos and then uh, Leo Panic uh, will, uh, will follow. And then Alex again for 10 minutes. 
Christianity imperialist of the contemporary age doesn't have a theory of imperialism. By that, by that I mean no, no Chomsky. Um, I, I attended the, the first of the two globalization lectures he gave at SOAS uh, a few weeks ago, and it was a magnificent tour to d'horizon and sort of demolition, intellectual demolition of the crimes committed by the, the powerful. But when you looked for a theoretical framework, there was one very striking moment when Chomsky quoted uh, the, the Melian Dialogues, which are a famous uh, passage of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, and he quoted, um, he quoted the follow following celebrated passage, the strong do what they have the power to do, and the, the weak accept what they have to accept. And I think it's actually true that <coughs> the implicit theoretical framework in Chomsky's anti-imperialist analyses are propositions of such transhistorical, both very thin and transhistorical character, that, that once you have concentrations of power, then you get the kind of behavior that we see in the case, say, of the United States today. And the work of explanation is done mainly by the detailed empirical descriptions of, of which Chomsky's writings are, are full. Now, I don't want to, to knock that, that approach to understanding imperialism because Chomsky's um, work is enormously powerful. But I think it's subject, it's subject to severe limitations. In particular, the kind of analyses that he offers lack any, they lack relief. There's a kind of relentless narrative of the crimes of the powerful. And um, the um, distinctive patterns and shifts in the behavior of power, powerful from one historical epoch to another largely disappear. By contrast, the classical Marxist theory of imperialism developed in the early 20th century sought to locate the distinctive patterns of modern imperialism in Marxist theory of the capitalist mode of production, not just left dogmatically on its own, but elaborated and developed by the very contributors to the theory of imperialism. So understanding the, in particular, the patterns of geopolitical conflict um, in the modern world are to be integrated into the, the rhythms and dynamics of capitalism as an economic system. Now, I say a lot in my book about the strengths and weaknesses of the classical Marxist theory of imperialism, and there are considerable weaknesses, but nevertheless, it's a tradition in which I want to build. And in my book, um, I seek to elaborate on an idea formulated independently by David Harvey and me a few years ago, that capitalist imperialism has to be understood as the intersection between two distinctive forms of competition, economic and geopolitical. I don't have time to elaborate on, on that. The, the virtue of understanding imperialism as the intersection of economic and geopolitical competition is that it continues the classical Marxist attempt to un integrate the understanding of geopolitics into a larger theory of capitalism, but it does so in a non-reductive way. It doesn't just treat what states do as the as a sort of instrumental consequence of the, the, the decisions of particular groups of big business. But I, the book attempts to substantiate this theory of imperialism. Uh, and I don't have time to, to talk about that now. Leo is a very distinguished contributor to contemporary um, debates on the radical and revolutionary left about uh, imperialism. And uh, what I want to do to bring our discussion into sharper focus is by considering three important questions uh, that have emerged in these debates, and which I think the contemporary economic crisis has definitively settled. The first is, has the capitalist economics, the capitalism as an economic system, lost its moorings in the international state system? Is the international state system, the international system of states, now from the perspective of the development of capitalism, uh, a historical anachronism. This is, of course, something that's been argued on both the, 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 in the liberal mainstream, but on the left by people like Tony Carter and Michael, Michael Negri. Now, I think that actually that question began to be settled empirically by what happened after 9-11, and in particular, 
uh, by the way in which the US responded to 9-11 with, with the assertion of national power as the, the way of dealing with what happened. But I think if one looks at the economic crisis, that um, has more clearly um, demonstrated the extent to which capitalism is embedded in the system of, of nation states. The rescues, the bank rescues, the bailouts, the huge 14 trillion US dollars, the huge amounts of money that have been pumped into the, the global economy were pumped in by nation states. And it's particularly striking the extent to which the EU's response was compromised and weakened by the fact that the, 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 the different kind of rescue plans and subsidies for cars and all that kind of, kind of thing were implemented by nation, nation states pursuing their, their own agenda. So it seems to me clear, whatever some people thought a few years ago, the, the kind of peak d days of euphoria about globalisation, that capitalism um, remains intertwined indissolubly with the, with the system of, of, of states. Now, I don't think that's controversial between me and Leo, but I think the next question is, and that is, ha has capitalism succeeded in emerging from the long downturn that set in, the long economic downturn that set in in the early, early 19, 1970s. Now, um, I'm, Leo may complain that I'm caricaturing his position, but he's here and extremely well equipped to correct any misrepresentations I made. But I take Leo to be saying that capitalism did succeed in doing that, in particular the historical meaning of, of neoliberalism um, was that by shifting the balance of class forces in favour of capital, it permitted a new era of um, economic expansion for capitalism. Also, if you look at the work of Leo and his colleagues um, on financialization, on the, the, role, the role of finance in conte contemporary capitalism, like the, the collection, American Empire and the Political Economy of Global Finance, that's the name isn't, that they published a couple of years ago, a very interesting collection, they, the tendency of their analysis is to stress uh, that financial crises play a functional role, particularly from the point of view of entrenching and extending the global dominance of, um, of, of the United States, of American capitalism. And in the, the introduction to their book, which you know we all have problems about timing, but the book appeared about a year ago, so just it must be written finally put together just as the, uh, the financial crisis was really kicking in, they describe the financial crisis as a problem of imperial management. Now I think it's clear that it's a little more than that. Uh, and I think also what we've seen um, is very, very clearly demonstrated is the way in which the whole process of financial, financialization, the uh, spread in particular, credit derivatives, the way in which the big investment banks um, dominated this, the whole process of the creation of those derivatives, drew in the, the global banking system, aligned themselves with hedge funds and high private equity firms, in all the ways that we're increasingly beginning to understand, at least empirically, had a profoundly destabilizing role. So I think that that's uh, a major problem in our analysis, but I think the, 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 uh, the analysis of the OMT's colleagues, but I think it's a, a symptom of a of a, a, a deeper problem, because I think the severity of the present crisis, and it seems to me that the crisis is a very long way from over, um, is, indicates, or I think provides significant support from, for, for, for those of us um, um, such as uh, Bob Brenner, Chris Harmon, and a number of other people I don't have time to cite, Alan Freeman, Andrew Kleeman, all, all, all sorts of people, who've developed an analysis that has sought to locate uh, a long-term set of structural problems facing in particular the advanced capitalist e econ economies um, and arising from a crisis of, of profitability that develops at the end of the, end of the uh, 1960s. And one of the last things that Chris Harmon wrote before his, his recent death, he uh, pulled together and documented the, the evidence supporting this analysis of a, a long-term crisis, crisis of profit, profitability. And I think it's important to, to see that despite neoliberalism, despite 
the enormous efforts to restructure societies, to force up the rate of exploitation, to reorganize the welfare state, to reorganize the economic functioning of, of capitalism, all of which are the, the effect of, as I think is agreed by most Marxist analysis, of bringing, forcing up the rate of exploitation, that didn't have the effect, although it led to a recovery in overall profitability in the advanced capitalist countries, it, it didn't bring the level of profitability back to where it was during the long economic boom of the 1950s and 1960s. This is reflected in the fact that in the last boom, the great boom of the subprime uh, speculative bubble in the middle of the present decade, levels of investment in the advanced capitalist countries remained relatively low, despite a recovery in profits, despite all the kind of gloss and bloom of the, uh, the speculative bubbles that, that developed developed in that, that period. And I think the best way of understanding, not the broad process of financialization, but the, the speculative bubbles that on the basis of that process of financialization drove the US and therefore the world economy in the late 90s and in the, uh, in the middle of the, the present decade is that they functioned as a way of displacing the underlying um, crisis, of, crisis of profitability and sustaining the expansion of the US and therefore the world economy, particularly through the mechanism that Bob Brenner has called asset price, price Keynesianism. In other words, if you're able to lever up, continually lever up the, the, price, the price of different kinds of financial assets, most uh, recently different kinds of real estate, the, the so-called wealth effect uh, kicks in. In other words, the owners of these assets feel richer, they borrow more, adding further to the great overhang of debt, debt which is such a distinctive feature that the economy is worst affected by the present crisis. People spend more maintaining effective demand. Quite predictably, uh, that the bubbles then eventually explode. And because of the way in which the most recent one drew in the bulk of the global financial system and its hangers on, uh, struck a paralyzing blow on the world economy from which it's still seeking to, to recover. So I think the, pro the underlying problems of global capitalism are much more severe and much more protracted and long term than Leo and his colleagues have uh, been ready to, to acknowledge. Have I got about five more minutes left, Jibbert? Yeah, we have six, seven. Six, seven minutes. Excellent. Good. Um, okay. That brings me to the third question that I want to address, which is, is US hegemony in decline? Now this, of course, is a very long-standing debate, and it's one that um, has uh, uh, assumed a slightly comic strip form um, as a result of the, the global crisis, in that now very large swathes of establishment of uh, opinion are prepared not simply to answer yes to the question, is US hegemony in decline, but to announce the end of US hegemony. You know, you look at Newsweek, you look, you look at lots of other kind of semi-popular organs of the, um, the, the, um, the Atlantic bourgeoisie, whatever one wants to call them, and they, they're really saying that US hegemony is over. You know, when Obama went to China, really, he was portrayed as the, you know, rather paradoxically, as the head of an old empire, uh, going to, you know, pay homage to the rulers of the new empire, paradoxically, because of course China's been in the empire business for a lot longer than the United States. But, uh, um, and um, I think that that kind of extremely superficial um, response to the kind of um, very significant developments that are going on at the present time are, aren't at all helpful to the, to the debate, and I suspect that's something that Leo and I would both agree about. I should also say that I myself have somewhat changed my views on this question um, over the past 10 years or so. 20 years ago, at the end of the Cold War, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, I expected there to be a fairly rapid return to the kind of inter-imperialist rivalries that were characteristic of imperialism in the early decades of the 20th century. And I underestimated the extent to which the US was able to maintain its, its hegemony despite quite powerful counter, 
counter pressure, pressures. And when, one, when one's mistaken, it's important to, to, to acknowledge that. And I think that if we look at the contemporary situation, that it's clear, despite the kind of cartoon uh, uh, depiction of the situation that I was re referring to, the US remains, and I think will continue to be for, for decades to come, probably, the dominant power in the system. If you look at its share of global national income, if you look at its centrality to the nexus of international institutions and alliances through which the leading capitalist classes are organized, if you look at the US's uh, military capabilities, if you also look at the US's, despite the blows struck it by the financial crisis, if you look at the US's position in the global financial si system, I mean, there's a lot of talk that the dollar um, is about to be supplanted by some unnamed alternative. Um, but that there's, there's very little evidence or sign of that actually happening. If you look at all those indices of rel relative power, the US remains the key organizing power of the system. Now, there's a mistaken conclusion that one can draw from that, which is everything is okay for the, the US. Perry Anderson, a few years ago, wrote an article in which she presented the US as the conductor, I think he said, of a, of a concert of powers, a very 19th century phrase evoking Castle Ray and Metternich and so on. And I would say that the, the, what the US actually will find itself and is finding itself doing uh, is orchestrating a growing disharmony, which wasn't, isn't, wasn't simply produced by the economic crisis, but is, I think, accelerated the disharmony by the, by the economic crisis. And, uh, the, it's easy to talk a lot about the US-China relationship, and uh, I could say a lot, but just to save time, I'll save that up for, um, um, for, for later on in the discussion, because I'm going to get a, a further bite of the cherry. But if one looks at, for example, the way in which, despite the fact the economic crisis has struck the Russian economy quite severely, if one looks at the greater confidence of the managers of the Russian state, and their willingness to press the United States on questions that they see as central to their sec security interests, that's symptomatic of quite a significant shift. I think the Georgian War um, was uh, a significant sign of the confidence of uh, Ru Russia's rulers that uh, the US's position, global position was weakening, it's distracted in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that therefore they they could press to extend their, their sphere, sphere of influence. I also think the change, the, the, the way in which, it's an overstatement to say that a real axis has developed between Moscow and Berlin. It's nothing resembling an, an alliance, but it's still quite interesting the way in which, first of all, the German government has tended to try and blunt conflicts between Russia and both the European Union and, and, and NATO. It's also interesting the extent to which uh, economic links have grown stronger between, um, uh, bet between Germany and Russia. I mean, Leo probably knows more about the, you know, the, the fantastic failed attempt to splice together uh, a Canadian parts company and Russian money to buy uh, General Motors subsidiaries in in Europe that blew up when General Motors decided it was okay and could, could keep hold of, the, uh, of, of its subsidiaries in, in Europe. But that's symptomatic of a, a longer term um, nexus of economic links binding, binding Germany. It's also interesting the extent to which the Germans have, have been resistant to the kind of push for a global financial fiscal stimulus that Obama pressed for, for example, the G20 um, summit in, in London early, earlier this, this year. This, isn't, this isn't, doesn't represent, these kind of tensions and conflicts, and I can talk about others, don't represent a lapse back into full-scale inter-imperialist rivalries. But what they, what they reflect is the way in which the changing global, economic, di global distribution of economic power makes it increasingly difficult for the US to, to manage the system. That doesn't mean that the US doesn't have strategies and, and employees to, um, to try and 
maintain its hegemony, and one shouldn't under underestimate its ability to achieve at least some of, it, some of its goals. But we're confronted with a situation in which a weakening imperial power is struggling increasingly with a world that it finds hard, hard to manage. That in some way, that, this is my final point, that creates in certain ways opportunities for the radical and revolutionary left if it has the political capacity to, to respond to them. But it also represents, I think, quite a dangerous situation for anyone who's concerned for the prospects for long-term peace. Okay, on that cheerful note, I'll, I'll end. to retain uh, 
saying that uh, we express some, uh, he rather, I should say, uh, before introducing the quotation, he said, we rather unwisely, end quote, express some skepticism about strong claims concerning the disastrous outcome of the current liquidity crisis for the global system of finance and America's position in it. Uh, uh, and then we added a sentence or two later, the main upshot, upshot of the current situation is that the American state finds itself with the peculiar and unanticipated problem of imperial management. Well, I would very much stand by that statement. Uh, and it depends what you mean by disaster. I mean, as Humpty Dumpty said, when I use a word, uh, it means just what I want it to mean. Uh, but I don't think one can be so loose with the term disaster. Uh, in introducing that statement, uh, Martin and I describe the situation, the crisis, the nature of the crisis, the depth of the crisis, in exactly the same terms that Alex just did in his opening remarks. That is severe. Indeed, we said it was the most severe since the Depression. The question is, what does one mean by disastrous outcomes for the global financial system and for the place of the American Empire? Uh, and here I think one has to say that the consequences, what is wrong with much Marxist theory uh, about crises, is that the consequences of crises need to be uh, examined in terms of whether they overwhelm the capacity of states to respond or adapt to those crises, and whether they galvanize forces for radical change in terms of their capacities and in terms of being able to build on the openings that crises create. But I think there are two ways of looking at the current crisis. You can look at it in terms of there, of there being a lack of state regulation, insufficient state regulation, even the state, as Alice often puts it uh, uh, in his writings, even the state fostering crises through its promotion of financialization uh, and, and uh, its promotion of bubbles. Or one can take the nature of capitalist financialization uh, over the last 50, 60 years, really, as inevitably uh, entailing a great deal of volatility, a great deal of instability, uh, as well as complexity, being highly crisis prone. And therefore, we can look with some marvel at the role that states have played in keeping the system going from moment of chaos to moment of chaos. In this sense, you can say you're looking at it one way or the other. Uh, is the glass half full or glass half empty? And in my view, what is remarkable, given the degree of financial volatility, given the extent of capitalist globalization, given the multi-state system that it must traverse, given the nature of uh, uh, currencies uh, and floating currencies over the last 40, 50 years, and the multitude of them involved in a vast array of trade and investment, and indeed hedging of trade and investment between <laughs> derivatives trade, it is quite remarkable the way the system has been kept going via uh, state intervention. Now here's, I think, where one needs to come to an analysis of imperialism and global capitalism, which is rather different <coughs> from that of the Marxist classics. Imperialism, when I wrote uh, uh, the first piece I started writing on this in 2000, a new left review called The New Imperial State, just before Art Negri's book on Empire came up. Imperialism, except in circles uh, like those of Alex's, was not much in favor on the left. No one used the word American Empire in the full spell war. It was remarkable. Uh, for the most part, imperialism was a polemical word on the left, uh, used mostly with regard to the <coughs> global south against the global north, uh, or against American geostrategic uh, bullying. Uh, if it was retained, and Alex, as he said, retained it in the classical way, it was with regard to the notion of imperial rivalry in a context where the other advanced capital states, the old empires, or the new ones, had been integrated into the American empire since 1945. As Alex said, he expected after the uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union, uh, you would see a reassertion of strong inter 
my view, uh, one needs to start somewhere else. Uh, one needs to understand the role of empires, uh, not merely in terms of the expression of geostrategic power and the expression of their capital's interests. You need to begin with it by the way Marxists need to look at the theory of the state. That is, capitalist states reproduce the conditions of uh, capital accumulation and the conditions of uh, class relations in a capitalist society. And in that sense, uh, I first, I guess, argued this 15 years ago in the essay State of Globalization in the Socialist Register. And I must say, Alex often identifies Perry Anderson's views with mine on this. Perry at that time was arguing that capital had gone international and the class was stuck in the nation state. Uh, and I attempted to argue against the theorists of globalization, that states were the authors of globalization. That they were essential to the making of globalization. That international treaties, the WTO, NAFTA, the European Union, etc., were treaties of states uh, who were engaged in, yes, in removing capital controls, but doing much more than removing them. They were crucial to the process of codification and legalization, which was essential to making globalization. In that sense, as with states, with the construction of laws upon which contract has to operate, upon which property is defended, upon which class relations are founded, states in the international arena must be seen as playing a similar role. Now, there are states and states. And, and, and the point of my writings on American empire has not been to attempt to rely the rather old, gory uh, Marxist notion of inter-imperial rivalry but rather to attempt to understand the, the internationalization of the state. Uh, and the American state in particular, but by no means alone, has, if you like, carried the greatest responsibility, they would say carried the greatest burden, in terms of making globalization happen. Uh, the reason for that, of course, has to do with the centrality of American capitalism uh, in the second half of the 20th century beyond that uh, uh, in global capitalism and the degree to which American capital is integrated uh, with global capital. There's a process of global capital, MMCs, international banks, uh, accounting firms, uh, etc. Uh, etc. Uh, 
And then thirdly, in relation to the crisis-prone nature of globalization, especially financialization, uh, uh, the American state has been uh, the firefighter-in-chief, uh, as a man of last resort, if you will. It has coordinated, as it did in the current crisis, the response of finance ministries and central banks around the world, providing them, at the height of the crisis, uh, through the swaps that have been arranged all the way back to the 60s when they were trying to save Bretton Woods, uh, through the swaps they provided to central banks in American dollars as they needed to uh, preserve their banking systems from going under. Keeping the interbank market going. The core of this crisis was that banks wouldn't lend to each other. And if banks don't lend to each other, just in terms of settling their overnight balance, the whole system seizes up. And the central role of the American Treasury and the Federal Reserve was to coordinate, and they did so in ways that were remarkably successful, uh, given the depth and severity of this crisis, uh, to get the London uh, interbank market going again. Uh, now, to some extent, one needs to stress that this is empire by invitation. This is not just a matter of the American state imposing itself on other states, or American capital doing so. Indeed, indeed, other states not only ask but demand of the American state that it plays this role. And when it doesn't do it, uh, that usually is interpreted in terms of class forces in the United States expressing themselves through Congress, preventing them from doing it. And that is seen, and I think that is, one of the contradictions in the American imperial role. The tension that exists between its role at the center of producing a global capitalism and its role as a state of the domestic social classes in the United States. Now, one of the central questions that, that Alex has asked, uh, as have many others, uh, he's answered it, I think, more soberly than most, is whether the material base continues for this central role the American empire plays in global capitalism. Uh, Mandel, as you know very well, in his Europe was America in 1970, and also in late capitalism, was predicting in the early 1970s that America was in decline on the basis of the challenge to the dollar that occurred in the late 1960s and 70s, uh, the defeat of Vietnam, and, and he was hardly unique in this. And, and generally, uh, the last 50 years have been made up of one version or another, more sophisticated or less, and, and Alex uh, referred to some of the less sophisticated, more cartoonish ones, uh, has been made up of uh, expectations that the American empire was passe. Uh, there was this 20 group year period, three periods of human history, uh, where this incredibly powerful state of capital emerged, and then uh, it's been on the decline ever since. And this has gotten mixed up with the profitability crisis thesis. I, uh, very much share the view that the crisis of the 70s was a crisis of profitability, <coughs> although I think that the working class played a very large role in producing that crisis of productivity with its industrial militancy uh, in the 1960s and, and 1970s. I don't think it was just competition uh, amongst capitals as well as uh, That said, uh, Alex is right uh, that, that uh, I take the view uh, that that profitability crisis was resolved. And I think it was resolved in good part by the capitalist states uh, facing the crisis together in the 1970s uh, and in the 1980s, coordinating uh, the opening up of capital markets, uh, the shifting of petrodollars to third world debt, and above all, coordinating the defeat of industrial militancy of trade union strength through uh, common neoliberal strategies, uh, which were developed uh, through the G7 and BIS, uh, etc. Uh, but the, the profitability crisis has spilled over to a decline of the material base of American empire. And it's often difficult to discern where the line is drawn, because often the profitability crisis thesis, the argument that it has continued, it's never been resolved. And the current crisis needs to be understood in terms of the crisis that began with the profitability of corporations in 1965 and 66, which is the view that Alex holds, I think is a mistake. Uh, I, I think it's been empirically proven 
you look at uh, 1983 to 1989, there was a recovery of promise. Uh, David Gallagher recently showed some well in historical material. Uh, and the kind of confusion one gets into is the kind that I think, let me say, Alex just referred to in his opening remarks. Uh, when profits began to, to turn down, actually they were declining through the 50s from the very high rates in, in the late 40s, uh, but there was a blip in the 1960s, especially in American profits, and then a very rapid decline after that. Uh, and, and Alex has pointed out that there was high profitability, as there indeed was in the run-up to the 2007 crisis, but that there was relatively low investment. Uh, well, in the late 1960s, as profits declined rapidly, there was very high investment on the part of uh, corporations. It wasn't until after 1973-74 that we got a decline in investment. So one needs to be extremely careful with what one is doing with these kinds of statistics. Uh, if one's making a profitability crisis argument, that's one argument. If one's making a lack of investment crisis, that's another. Now what really works here is the old Marxist notion that you have to explain crises in terms of the falling rate of profit. It's, it, it, you know, whether one wants to do it, as, as Alex still does, in terms of Marx's tendency to rate profit to fall because of um, the centralization of capital displacing labor, and capital lives, after all, by suckling the surplus of living workers, uh, or whether you do it as Brenner does and rejects that view and does it in terms of uh, competition amongst capitals and uh, not pushing profits to a negative level and therefore firms that should be driven out of the market don't exit. Uh, either way, whatever you do, it, the, any crisis that occurs in the financial system that is triggered uh, in the financial system and then has a knock-on effect throughout the economy has to be explained on the basis of a deeper crisis in the productive sector. And I think this is simply a mistake. There's no reason for it than the Marxists to follow it, uh, and I think it's an attempt to hold on to uh, a view that is, 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 I think, leading us off in a very uh, mistaken direction. Uh, in terms of, of American material capacity, yes, there's been enormous overcapacity in the auto industry, but let that extend and, and, and uh, restructuring it, and in some of the other core industrial sectors like steel. That's an old story. But let's remember that uh, there's been enormous foreign direct investment inside the United States by auto firms above all the Japanese on uh, That has entailed tremendous suffering for workers in the North. It's created all kinds of jobs for workers in the South, many of them not unionized, which is very important in terms of measuring the class struggle of the United States in its capacity. Uh, those who, like Mandel, were predicting the decline of the United States in 1970, uh, were doing so just as the computer industry, just as uh, the uh, biotechnical re revolution, the biological revolution was emerging. Uh, and the United States to this day uh, has greater R&D than all the other G7 countries uh, combined. But perhaps most important is that what this misses is the way in which industry and finance are integrated. You know, when we speak of derivatives, Dick Bryan is here, um, he knows better than anyone else in the room, he's here from Australia for the ancient conference as well, and he's written about this and understood it better than any Marxist uh, on the planet. Uh, derivatives aren't just undertaken by financial speculators, although, of course, they're at the center of it. 20% uh, uh, of derivatives trading is done by non-financial institutions, mainly big corporations. Uh, and much of the other trading in derivatives is done by, uh, by banks or uh, other financial agents acting as intermediaries for corporations. A lot of it has to do with hedging your bets on what exchange rates will be and interest rates will be three months, be one week, uh, or six months down the road. Uh, one of the people who have been one of the groups who have been complaining most loudly about regulation of derivatives has been industrial capital engaged in multinational capital engaged in derivative trade in recent years. Uh, this is not a new thing. In 1970, the three largest uh, industrial corporations in the United States, the three largest retail companies in the United States, uh, both of them uh, uh, offered more consumer credit than the three largest commercial 
the first really severe crisis of the financialization era, which occurred long before deregulation, uh, was the crisis uh, brought about by the Fed attempting to stem inflation for the first time in 1969 when it pushed interest rates up to 9% by 1970 and caused the bankruptcy of the, large, the eighth largest bank in the United States, uh, corporation in the United States, and Central, which was the largest owner of real estate in the United States. Uh, that was a crisis, not a bank crisis, but a crisis in what was known as the commercial paper market. Uh, the market of corporations uh, putting out bonds through investment banks in order to raise money for investment. Uh, when you push interest rates to 9% on treasury bills, uh, you then create a crisis in the commercial paper market insofar as you can hold uh, U.S. state-backed, absolutely guaranteed paper rather than corporate paper. And once Penn Central went bankrupt, the uh, fear was that IBM uh, and Chrysler wouldn't be able to turn over their debt in 1970. Uh, it was at that point that you saw the Fed rush in, and the Nixon rush in, attempting to bail out uh, uh, those corporations, and they did so uh, by providing the banks open access to the discount windows so they would lend money uh, to uh, the corporations, and they did. Uh, now, I stress this because you see there the essential role of the state not in terms of projecting American capital's power externally, but the central role of the state in creating the conditions for continued capital accumulation. And that's the way we need to understand empire in terms of the internationalization of the state as well. I'll just finish with this, uh, uh, Leaving aside the question of the interpretation of crisis, and I certainly think that, that a financially triggered crisis can be a very severe crisis. And I think this one has, has posed to the agencies and institutions that are engaged in trying to stick their finger in the dam the greatest challenge uh, that they've yet faced amongst the 139 financial crises that have been counted since 1973. But remember, there were also some 40 of them between 1945 and 1971. This has been a long process of financialization, not one that suddenly emerged. And, and the American state and American multinational capital was involved really heavily in making it happen in the 50s. But apart from that, uh, there is, I think, and this comes up more in uh, uh, the very interesting book uh, that on imperialism and, and global political economy, and that I say on the way here. Uh, that Alex has written, uh, or produced this year, in the book last year. Alex reasserts the old Marxist theory of imperialism, he says it's mistaken in many ways, by attempting to uh, use his and David Harvey's notion uh, that one needs to see uh, imperialism as an intertwining of economic competition and geostrategic competition. Uh, and unlike those who would say, but geostrategic competition, right, surely insofar as it takes place amongst capital states, that's also economic competition. Uh, and economic competition can't be understood narrowly in, certain, in terms of merely being competition over what, profits, market shares. The state is always involved in that economic competition internationally. So what are you getting at here? And Alex says, well, what I'm really getting at is that uh, international capital uh, is not highly concentrated and centralized to such an extent that there are not many capital, entirely real. Uh, and he criticizes rightly Hilperton's theory of finance capital and the effect it had uh, on Lenin and Ricard and so on uh, in terms of thinking uh, that there was this unity of capital that under the imprint of finance, financial oligarchy, that had already been created in the early part of the it didn't even apply to the United States then, although it applied to Germany. Uh, he says there are many capital. But he tries to hold on to this, I think, by thinking of these many capitals as equivalent to many states. He tends to think of the conflict, the competition that exists geostrategically still, in terms of a state representing its capital, or its capitalism. 
Now, there's, I, I do think there is not one gross international bourgeoisie. Capital has retained national identities as, uh, fortunately, or in most cases, unfortunately, we're working class have. But the degree of interpenetration of capital, their codependence in globalization, the institutionalized ways in which they interact with one another, are such that they are strong supporters, even in the third world of the processes of globalization. It isn't only the Chinese that hold American dollars. It's also Chinese capitalists who hold American assets. And that reflects the fact that they have greatest confidence in the American state as the guarantor of property internationally. This is something that goes back to the Depression. America ended up with all of the gold in the world in the 1930s in, in Port Knox. Because bourgeoisies who could get their money out of uh, the capital controls that were installed, installed in the 1930s moved their money to New York, even while the New York Wall Street bankers were calling those no the socialists. Uh, I've gone too long. I think the point is clear. One final, really one final point. And that has to do with class struggle and how they have to get out of this. <coughs> What surprised me most about uh, Alex's very interesting book, and it's, it's very weird and very good, was that it ends with, as he ended tonight, with a prediction of increased competition, most of it geostrategic. Why do the Russians go into Georgia, et cetera, uh, rather than increased economic coordination. Uh, but, but that it said nothing about class struggle. What would be the conditions for the kind of challenges to American empire that would be progressive rather than regressive. And I've always seen what we're doing here in terms of the need to stress that unless the class and state structures of Europe and Japan and indeed China are fundamentally changed, we will not have the type of inter-imperial challenges uh, that are likely to be progressive. <laughs> and I think this is really the crucial point, that the bourgeoisies and the states of the rest of the world are integrated into an American empire in a way that can only be disassembled by a reassertion of socialist revolutionary strategy. Stimulated Marx to start his major work on 
rates, the financial burdens that the major states have acquired will, will be, whether they're sustainable, whether the dollar will collapse, the whole series of questions that are open ones and that are produced by this crisis. So I don't think it's good enough just to say, oh, well, you know, this is just a bit of, a bit of vol volatility. On the question of the crisis of profitability, well, it's, it's boring. It's really boring to say, oh, you didn't notice that the rate of profit recovered in the 1980s. It's obvious on any set of figures, the rate of profit recovered in the, in the, in the 1980s. But I think, and again, I'd recommend to you a uh, piece by Chris Harman, which is available on the International Socialism website, that looks seriously at a whole, uh, summarises the results of a whole series of different studies of, of profitability, and that shows that there has not, in the advanced capitalist economies, been a recovery of profitability to the levels of the 1950s and, and 1960s. And I think, you see, the part of the difficulty is that because Leo sees crises as caused by, um, uh, by the sh shifts in the balance of, of class forces, crisis, crisis and recoveries, uh, he, he's unable to um, get a measure of the depth of the problems that I think the system has faced, which is despite bashing workers as hard as they have, despite the fact that in the last so-called boom, um, uh, the uh, real um, uh, median uh, um, household income in the United States fell by $2,000, $2, despite this immense squeezing of the, the working class, they were not able to restore the rate of rate of profit to the levels uh, that, um, that had supported the boom of the, 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 the 19, 1950s and 1960s. And I think that that partly reflects um, theoretical problems, a collapse, you know, for the Marxist economists among you, collapsing the rate of surplus value, or collapsing the rate of profit into the rate of surplus value, uh, and therefore not taking into account the huge problem of the deep, of uh, over-accumulation that capitalism um, uh, faces and the, the bailouts, if, any, if anything, have increased. Now, of course, there are all sorts of questions about the relationship between financialization and crisis, and I, I think it's perfectly possible for um, a financial crash, if sufficiently severe, to produce, produce a recession, uh, a broad economic re recession. But I think that um, I think that simply to assert that this was a financial crash that produced a recession doesn't address sufficiently the extent to which we can see very clearly in the policy pursued by the Fed from the late 1990s onwards that there's, uh, there's, uh, the measures are taken to encourage rises in asset prices in order to sustain borrowing and, and, and effective demand. I'm not saying it's a plot or anything like that, but there's a, there's a, it seems to me that there's a definite shi shift in, towards tolerating financial bubbles as a way of sustaining economic uh, um, expansion. Now, of course, there's much more to be said about financialization. I think uh, Brian and Rafferty's book on derivatives is terribly interesting and it shows how functional derivatives are, how it's not just a matter of a few bankers speculating them, and so, so on and so forth. But it, I think it's a criticism of their book that reading their book, you wouldn't guess that the enormous kind of palace, no, 
capitals based in their economy and promoting their interests and so on, so on and so forth. Maybe a bad theory, maybe false. I don't think it, I don't think it's in instrumentalist because it sees the dri the drivers to state action as being more um, um, uh, as uh, as uh, involving more than the interests of capital. And in a, in, in a way, I mean, like Leo's own arguments are, are, are interesting about uh, what states do and so on are interesting, but they're entirely concerned between the interface between states and, and capitals, or capital, not really capitals actually, there's not that much differentiation among capitals because they've all, they're all increasingly inter integrated and co-dependent, co and I think that um, that doesn't capture the extent to which interstate Rivalries of different kinds, not necessarily at all taking the form of full blooded inter imperialist conflicts and so on, um, remain a reality. When Leo says the US penetration of Europe was empire by invitation, I mean, you know, read the documents, read the studies that have been made about, I mean, he has read them, but uh, he, he cites them, the studies of the extent of the conflict between Britain and the US in the immediate post-war period and the extent to which the, the British government's fight to retain control over their economy and over their enemy against the pressures from the, the, the United States. The Brits lose. There's no question about that for all, all sorts of reasons. But this wasn't, it's, uh, it's absolutely not a picture of the British just, you know, rolling over and letting, letting the US uh, t take them over. One shouldn't read the puppy dogness of Tony Blair back into too far into into history, and it just does seem to me that unless you um, unless you take into account the dimensions of both economic and geopolitical rivalries, <laughs> and the way in which they interweave and overlap in all sorts of ways, which is partly captured by Leo's analysis, but not in, sufficiently, you fail to take into account of something that I think he denies, which there are still distinct centres of capitalist power in the, in the world. There isn't simply a nexus at the centre of which is, is the United States. It's, it's impossible to explain the behaviour, say, of German capital and the German state if you simply see them as uh, codependent in a subordinated way to the, to the United States. That isn't, doesn't mean that we're about to see a, 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 a return to inter-imperialist rivalries, but any, it, it simply, we simply will not grasp what is going to happen to the world in the next decades if we don't acknowledge the existence of different centres of capitalist power in the world? And it's a weakness of Leo's analysis that he doesn't, he doesn't sufficiently acknowledge that. But I'll stop there.